You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So, Glenn, uh, we've got a pretty interesting one here. After Donald Trump lost $83 million in the E. Jean Carroll case, Alina Haba tweeted, this is far from over, we're just getting started. And then Trump went online just a couple days later, and he posted, I'm in the process, along with my team, of interviewing various law firms to represent me in an appeal. And then, of course, he went on his usual unhinged screed, but it was a reference to Judge Kaplan's ruling. And so it would seem to me that Alina Haba had expressed her intention to continue representing him. Uh, does it look like she just got unceremoniously dumped here? You know, it looks like she may have thought that they were just getting started, and Donald Trump may have thought, no, I'm done with you, Alina Haba. And a couple of things, Brian. First of all, wouldn't that be on brand for Donald Trump to just unceremoniously fire somebody via a tweet or a post? And here's the other thing. Alina Hoppe was just the lead counsel in a case where he got taken to the cleaners $83.3 million in damages. I hate to say this, and I didn't think I would ever say it. Looking back, Joey Takapina might have been a genius because Donald Trump didn't even set foot in the courtroom. During the first defamation trial, that jury awarded $5 million. Donald Trump was in the courtroom early and often during the second trial, and that jury awarded $83 million. I don't know if there's a cause and effect there, but it sure looks like, based on Donald Trump's post, he's not looking to have Alina Haba head up you know, the team that will be working his appeal. Well, now, in fairness here, is it unusual for a client to take on new attorneys for an appeal versus the initial trial? You know, Brian, it's a mixed bag. I not only prosecuted lots of cases in the trial court, but I argued lots of appeals as a government lawyer. In other words, as the prosecutor in the appellate court seeking to have a, a lower court decision, a conviction affirmed on appeal. It's not unusual for a defendant who has lost a trial to look for a different lawyer, to look for maybe a law firm that specializes in appeals. Because I will say there are different skill sets and different experiences that are helpful for a trial lawyer to have versus for an appellate lawyer to have. There's a lot more writing that goes into handling an appeal. And it's a different kind of argument when you are arguing to three appellate court judges as opposed to arguing to a jury in the trial court. So sometimes people who lose, either in a civil case or in a criminal case, will look for new appellate counsel, but sometimes they will keep their own um, attorney who represented them through the trial and use that attorney as their attorney on appeal. So it really is a mixed bag. It's not a one size fits all approach. And again, I mean, to, to, to the point of what we're talking about right here, Donald Trump did keep Joey Takapina for his appeal. And so it would suggest that that he has a proclivity to do so when he likes the attorney. And so that really wouldn't wouldn't reflect too well on Alina Haba. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, that's true. And it's interesting because if you'll remember a day or two before the second defamation trial was to start, Joey Takapina announced, I'm out, I'm quitting, I'm leaving Team Trump, then actually went on to give a TV interview where he was asked, do you think Donald Trump could be criminally convicted in some of the some of his cases that are pending against him? And Joey Takapina kind of inexplicably for a former defense attorney said, oh, absolutely, he could be convicted. So you know, interesting choices all around, but it did look like Donald Trump had kept Joey Takapina as his lawyer even after losing that first $5 million judgment and was intending to use him in the appeal for that case. Now it looks like Donald Trump has perhaps made a different decision when it comes to Elena Haba. Now, what we don't know, Brian, and in fairness, when he sent out, you know, his typical nonsensical rambling screed, he said that his, quote, team is involved in looking for a law firm that will handle the appeal. What we don't know is, does his team still include Elena Haba, or has she been shown the door? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Glenn, based on what we know about this case, uh, and the extent to which it, it's it's kind of a, been a disaster for Donald Trump from the very beginning, and is a home run for E. Jean Carroll's team, why would any law firm sign up to represent him here? Is it anything other than just expensive PR for that firm? You know, sometimes you ask questions that stump me, Brian. I don't know that I have a good answer. Well, that that right there unto itself is kind of an answer. <laughs> yeah, stump the analyst. Um, it, 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 it's hard for me to understand why any lawyer or law firm would now 
take on Donald Trump as a client. Now, personally, I would say it's hard for me to understand why anybody would ever take on Donald Trump as a client. But let me hasten to add, everybody is entitled to a defense. Everybody is entitled to zealous representation. But that doesn't fully answer the question, why would a lawyer now hitch their wagon to Donald Trump when, first of all, Donald Trump has done nothing but lose in case after case after case. They've all been civil cases. But trust me when I say he is about he is about to start losing in criminal prosecutions as well. His time is coming. Uh, but the other thing is he's notorious for stiffing his lawyers. I mean, look at Rudy Giuliani, who himself had to file for bankruptcy. And one of the assets he listed in his bankruptcy filing was the money that Donald Trump owes him that he stiffed him for for legal representation. So why in the world any lawyer would take on Donald Trump as a client at this point? I don't have an answer to that. Glenn, doesn't Donald Trump stand to lose even more money by moving forward with, with this, this completely baseless appeal? Like there are going to be court fees, there are going to be attorney's fees. And and kind of as an addition to that, um, could E. Jean Carroll's team uh, countersue to recover fees from Trump? Yeah, so let me start with the last question first. You really can't counter sue somebody because they file an appeal, even a frivolous appeal, a baseless appeal, an appeal that you have no hopes of winning because the process allows every litigant who loses in the trial court to file an appeal. So E.G. and Carroll can't really counter sue Donald Trump for filing a frivolous appeal. But here's where it becomes really interesting, and it is really the, the monetary piece of this. When Donald Trump lost the first trial, you know, ordinarily when you appeal a case, you have to put a pot of money up to make sure that when and if you lose the appeal, the winning party, E. Jean Carroll, will get her five million. There are two ways to address that as the losing party. You can put up a bond, and all a bond is, Brian, in the simplest possible terms, is you're paying somebody a fee, the bondsman, to guarantee that you will pay out after you lose the appeal. How would you like to be the bondsman who's going to step up, put his reputation on the line and say, Donald Trump's good for it? He'll certainly make E. Jean Carroll whole for the entire yeah. five million. Now, what we know- Sounds, Brian, sounds like a bondsman who, uh, who, who's, who's ready to retire. That's yeah. what that sounds I mean, like. Even a, a, a MAGA type, I don't think, would want to take that risk. So here's the thing. Donald Trump didn't put up a bond to secure the $5 million judgment. What did he do? He paid the whole 5 million, actually 5.55 million to the court to hold it in escrow, in cash, liquid assets. Now he has another decision to make. He now has an $83 million judgment against him. How is he gonna secure the, that money? How is there gonna be a guarantee that E. Jean Carroll will get that money at the end of the appellate litigation? Do you think it, he's gonna find a bondsman? Now, we don't know if he couldn't find one to guarantee the $5 million, but he didn't use a bond. Is he going to be able to find a bondsman to guarantee he will pay out $83 million? I'm suspecting not. So what's he going to have to do? He's going to have to take $83 million that could otherwise be invested and earning a return or even just you know put in a, an account and earning interest. He's going to have to take $83 million and put it in the court's hands if he's going to get to appeal the $83 million judgment. I don't know about you, but I don't think he can rummage around the couch cushions at Mar-a-Lago and come up with $83 million. So, and what do we know? There's a third big money judgment waiting in the wings because any day now, Judge N. Goron is going to issue his ruling and Tish James in that case is seeking $370 million. I'm not saying that Donald Trump is ready to go the way of Rudy Giuliani and file for bankruptcy. But I think on the financial front, things just got real for Donald Trump. All right, well, that seems like a good place to leave off. We will stay on top of this as all of these appeals and any more financial damages that Donald Trump has to pay continue to, to work their way through the process here. So for anybody watching, if you want to follow along, please make sure to subscribe. The links to both of our channels are right here on this screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.